The Critical Care Nephrology Fellowship. The course is unique, flagship, wholly online program delivering up-to-date knowledge and evidence-based, patient-oriented experience in the principles and practice in critical care nephrology. It is structured as three modules, 32 credit hours each. Each module will be delivered over a 16-week period. The admission is open for all physicians who have worked or currently working in nephrology or critical care programs, along with physicians who work in the intensive care units. The fellowship program is delivered by nephrology critical care experts from various national and international programs. to enhance the exposure of the candidates to different clinical experience and practice. The education is delivered in the form of online lectures, case-based discussions, critical appraisal of scientific papers, and problem-solving exercises. Clinical scenarios and real-life practical experience are discussed online by experts in the field. Moreover, virtual workshops will be conducted synchronously Upon completion of the program, fellows will be able to master different aspects related to the continuous renal replacement therapy, ECMO, ventricular assisted and other cardiac devices, manage different challenges in critically ill patients, recognize the ICU emerging technologies and treatment modalities, understand novel advances, therapeutic options and recent research findings and implications of artificial intelligence in critical care medicine. Receive American Association of Continuing Medical Education Fellowship Graduation Certificate. For more info, visit workkidneyacademy.org. For registration, scan the QR code. The Critical Care Nephrology Fellowship. The course is unique, flagship, wholly online program delivering up-to-date knowledge and evidence-based patient-oriented experience in the principles and practice in critical nephrology. Welcome everyone and congratulations for attending our first webinar in the clinical, Critical Care Nephrology Fellowship. And uh, uh, this is sponsored by the World Kidney Academy and accredited by the American Association of Continuing Medical Education. Here is our today's agenda. I'm going to give you some uh, background and introduction about the fellowship program and will introduce the fellowship board to you. Then Dr. Khaled Siwifi is going to show you the program syllabus and the timetable and curriculum. Then we are going to give you some samples of the scientific materials including MCQs, clinical case scenarios, and journal club. The MCQs are going to be presented by Dr. Wakar Kashev. Then Dr. Rola is going to give you some samples from the clinical case scenarios. And uh, Dr. Ricardo Matas is going to give you a journal club uh, overview. Here is our international board member, um, I'm Amr Hosseini, a professor of nephrology at University of Kentucky. I'm the program director. Dr. Khaled Suifi is the academic director. He's a consultant uh, critical care uh, physician in the MAM, Saudi Arabia. And uh, Dr. Craig from South Africa is associate program director. Jacob uh, from Spain uh, is associate program director. Rola Othman who works in Al Nur Hospital in Mecca is also one of the um, associate program directors. And Dr. Wakar Kashif, who is well-trained in America, is board certified in internal medicine 
and in nephrology and also in critical care nephrology um, is one of the respected uh, board members. Dr. Ashraf Tayar is academic co-director. He's uh, working in Saudi Arabia. Dr. Ricardo Matis from Portugal. He is one of the senior consultant uh, in critical care medicine. And uh, Dr. Serin Vaz, he is a consultant in India. And Professor Yasser Abdul Hamid, he is a professor at Cairo University. So these are our diversity. And we have uh, almost everyone from different background and uh, different country. So the diversity uh, in our program is very essential, both from the board side and also from the fellow side. Why did we choose critical care nephrology for one year fellowship? Because actually critical care nephrology cases are very challenging and if not uh, managed uh, properly and precisely, it might have a devastating consequences. And there is a huge managing gap, especially in the developing countries. So we need to have more consistency and to have consensus regarding the critical uh, clinical uh, ill patients management. We also um, aiming to um, build up more expertise and trainers in this area, especially in the third world country. This program is wholly online, three modules. Each module is 16 weeks, so almost uh, each module is uh, four months, so the total is one year. It's not only webinars or seminars, but it's a dialogue more than monologue. So it's a, a bi-directional uh, educational program. So we depend and we rely on the fellows engagement and activities rather than just uh, um, you know asking them to be in the back seat and to be um, receptive. Um, the, there will be weekly assessment and evaluation and uh, educational materials will be released in a smart platform on a weekly basis. We are going to discuss with you how to critically think and appraise this critically ill patients and gather a panel of expertise. Again, the program is mainly asynchronized training because of the different time zone. So the materials, you will have access to the materials through out the whole week. You can listen and watch the video lecture. Then you can read the, the journal club. Then you answer the MCQs, the clinical case scenarios. Uh, you have the whole week to do this. So you can do it over the weekends or the weekdays. Usually it takes about three to four hours on average every week to do this. On top of that, there will be synchronized education in forms of either webinars or live workshops and video conferencing, uh, at least on a monthly basis. So all the um, fellows activities are recorded and all the scientific material will be released at the beginning of each week on Monday, 8 a.m. GMT. And uh, all fellows will have the freedom to navigate throughout the scientific material and to finish their tasks and assignments by the end of Sunday midnight GMT. So everyone is encouraged to finish and to get engaged and to do the assignments and tasks on weekly basis. Again, all activities and contribution of the fellows, uh, you know, and uh, the assignments and tasks are monitored in the smart platform. And there will be a weekly qualitative and quantitative assessment and evaluation for all the fellows, mainly based on their engagement and to learn. It's not only about to pass the test or to get a better score, but to get engaged in the fellowship and to learn. So the application is now open uh, for registration and payment and participation. Application deadline is March 31st. Acceptance of notification will be in April 15. So please, if you haven't done it yet, go ahead and register and finalize your application. Uh, today is our orientation meeting. Uh, there will be an induction meeting on Wednesday, April 17th. So please mark your agenda 
for 4 p.m. GMT Wednesday, April 17th for an induction meeting. We'll give you more and more information about the program. The final webinar right before we start the fellowship will be the onboarding meeting. It will be Wednesday, May 15th, uh, 4 p.m. again GMT. So please mark your agenda to attend both the induction and the onboarding meeting in April and May. The Critical Care Nephrology Fellowship Program should start uh, in May 2024. And uh, the, uh, the aim of uh, our program is to make sure that uh, you are well trained and to get high quality education, well structured, well organized training. And because of the time difference, all the materials will be uh, released asynchronously uh, and, um, you know, we've been either in, um, you know, the platform or uh, throughout the webinar and workshops. The graduates uh, are expected to move from a trainees and mentees level to a trainer and uh, mentor level. And uh, by the end of the program, you will receive an American accreditation for 96 credit hour with graduation certificates for the fellowship. If you haven't done yet, you can use 15% uh, promo code of early bird. So please try to do this. The promo code expires uh, on March 15. And uh, you can gather into a group of 10 participants. Then you can get 25% for group participation. We are offering also several uh, scholarships, 100% tuition fees for those who are from low income countries. So make sure these are the people, the candidates who are, you know, applying from these uh, low income countries, they can get free admission to the program. They have to prove that they are going to help and they are going to uh, be, you know, very um, interested in helping their uh, unprivileged communities and poor countries. So if you are one from, you know, one from these countries, please feel free to apply for free scholarship. It's a competitive process and we will have a committee to select those who are uh, who are going to show more evidence that they are going to be more helpful to their unprivileged communities. Again, the aim of the education is not the knowledge itself, but the practice, the action, how to help our people, our sick patients, and how to improve our standard of care as in countries. Um, I'm going to stop by here and I will let uh, Dr. Khaled Suifi, our academic director, to uh, give you uh, some information about the program, syllabus, curriculum, and timetable. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I'm really very happy uh, to see all of you uh, tonight. And uh, I hope the, my little presentation will be beneficial for all of you because we're going to talk about the syllabus of the fellowship, which is one of the most important issue. I believe most of you are asking about it. Uh, if you go to look at the critical care nephrology fellowship, it comes always into two different flavors because we combine the uh, nephrology and critical care at the same page and expect to learn a lot about both of them. So it will be very, very beneficial and unique program. Um, and we, we focused on um, uh, managing a, a life-threatening uh, situation to stabilize patient. And at the same time, you are kind, you're trying to treat the underlying etiology. So we thought that both are important. So you learn how to really run the CRT machine. And at the same time, you are focusing on uh, the underlying etiology of the patient and how you correct that kind of uh, pathology in, in severely ill patient. That's why we thought that critical care nephrology fellowship is very, very unique. And if you go to look at the uh, how we are designing the CRT teaching, we are not focusing only about the technique, uh, prescription and troubleshooting only, but we are focusing also about the concept of CRT, how the CRT is running how to uh, uh, modify CRT to improve the outcome of your vision. 
uh, through the kind of treasure to uh, really uh, admit to this fellowship. It's the kind of treasure. It's composed of three modules, as uh, Dr. Uh, Amri mentioned. Uh, the module one will focus about the foundation of critical care nephrology, and the module two will go to specific nephrological syndromes and critical care nephrology. Uh, module three will speak about advanced critical care nephrology uh, issues. So if you go to detail of the uh, program, you will find clearly that each module uh, is, a, is running for around 16 weeks, and each module is composed of nearly three chapters. Uh, each, each chapter made of three main topics, and each topic runs for one week. And uh, week four will have uh, a kind of uh, uh, case presentation and discussion, and uh, 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 it will be after each chapter, uh, each, each module. So uh, uh, module uh, uh, one, uh, you, you'll have a kind of uh, uh, three lectures about the introduction, and we'll learn here about the definition, scope, and significance of critical care nephrology, uh, the strategies uh, for improving the quality of care in critical care nephrology. Uh, also, we'll, uh, we'll have a special week about uh, volume assessment, uh, fluid resuscitation, and how to uh, 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 to assess fluid responsiveness and how much is how much actually uh, regarding fluid resuscitation. Also, we'll learn about the diuretic therapy and how you uh, perfectly use it in a proper way. Uh, you have uh, as the chapter two and the module one is about AKI, and uh, here we have a three lecture. Uh, also, first lecture about epidemiology, causes, pathogenesis. Second lecture will speak about staging of AKI, uh, diagnosis and the tree and the management as well. Uh, and the third lecture will talk about acid-base balance. And here we'll speak about the acid-base balance in critically ill patients, not like uh, regular acid-base balance. Uh, and this chapter three here in the module one, this is a very unique chapter because we will talk extensively about the CRT in three lectures. The first lecture will be about prescription, how to prescribe, how to initiate, when to initiate, uh, how much the dose of the CRT, and uh, what about the modes? Does the mode make difference or not? Uh, the anticoagulation, including citrate anticoagulation, in full details in, uh, in, in one uh, week. We have also troubleshooting, uh, CRT troubleshooting uh, uh, will be solely in one week as well. Then we'll follow with uh, a virtual workshop uh, we'll, with one of the most expert people in the field. We'll bring the machine uh, virtually and we'll speak in details about the uh, uh, prescription technique as well as the troubleshooting uh, issues. Then we'll go for module two, and here you'll learn about the shock state, uh, especially septic shock. Uh, uh, three lectures here, substance septic shock, one lecture. Body trauma, including uh, uh, abdominal compartmental syndrome, rhabdomyolysis, uh, also issues, and related to what's the relation with renal failure and CRT. Uh, the third lecture will be about the uh, cardiorenal syndrome, which you know it's very, very common nowadays to see a cardiorenal syndrome. Um, the, uh, the second chip, chap chapter in module two, you'll have a liver and multi-organ failure. Uh, three lectures also, one lecture about the acute liver failure and MARS and how to dialyze really, how to uh, 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 make a liver dialysis. We will have a, a special week about the uh, hepaturenal syndrome. And uh, lastly, we'll talk about the multi-organ failure in the setting of acute kidney injury. Uh, the third chapter will be about renal replacement therapy uh, uh, with, uh, 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 with the mechanical devices. It's about three lectures, one about the ECMO, one about the ventil uh, ventricular assisted device, and one about the drugs and uh, how really to prescribe drugs in acute kidney injury, CKD, and CRRT. And, uh, uh, and drugs also, uh, which is going to be metabolized or 
uh, 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 or dialyzed by CRT, uh, how to play with it. So drug chapter also is very unique here to understand the all pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drugs. Then we'll go for module three, and here we'll speak about the, the advanced critical care nephrology issues. We'll have uh, um, a helpful tools uh, chapter. We'll have a three lecture here, lecture about nutrition and renal disease, which will be very, very unique, lecture about the quality issues, and uh, uh, lecture about the ethics and safety. And here you, you have also uh, a kind of novel critical care treat, tre uh, treatment approaches. Uh, we'll speak about the, emer the emergency of the technology uh, in the uh, CRT, or like using extracorporeal blood purification therapy and also extracorporeal CO2 removal. Uh, we'll speak also about the researches and the critical care nephrology uh, topic. Uh, uh, here, Dr. Ashraf Ter, also uh, one of the most experts in the world about the ultrasound, will have a dedicated uh, 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 chapter about the focus of uh, 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 ultrasound with renal disease. The timetable, I gave you an example of that. Uh, you can see here the module one, week one, week two, week three, you can see the speakers. Uh, you have to understand that the speakers, uh, we, we have a faculty members which is sharing and uh, teaching this kind of materials, uh, but also we have guest speakers uh, from uh, all over the world, uh, which are most expert in those kind of topics, talking also, uh, sharing with us in the uh, fellowship. So you can see here on the right, the speaker's name and week one, week two, week three, and the topics, and you can see week four, is a kind of uh, case presentation uh, and uh, discussion, uh, open discussion webinar. Uh, this is uh, chapter two, uh, chapter three. Uh, if you go for uh, chapter three, you can see here Dr. Kamel Atta will have a, a virtual workshop about the prescription troubleshooting. And end of the uh, uh, module one, we'll have a semi-final assignment and exam. Uh, between week 13 and week 16. Module two, you can see the timetable here also, and you can see uh, the faculty uh, uh, speakers having lecture and also guest speakers having lecture, and the week four, as usual, uh, case presentation and discussion. You can see chapter two and then chapter three, and again, at the end of the module, you find semi-final assignments and exams. This is a module three, uh, and then at the end of module three, uh, you will find also this final exam, uh, uh, important uh, to pass the final exam to get the, uh, the fellowship. Uh, so it is crystal clear that uh, crit uh, critical care nephrology fellowship, it's very, very beneficial and very unique. I, I don't believe that we have in the whole world a kind of program like that. I am preparing the materials now, and I can see really that we are extens extensively studying uh, and trying to review all articles all over the uh, world to find the, the best material for you. And so you'll find really the material is extensive, and by the end of the year, you will be an expert in critical care nephrology. Uh, as usually telling, like uh, Albert Einstein, you have to learn the role of the game and then you play it better than anyone else. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Continue, Dr. Amor, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khaled, for this nice uh, layout. Uh, the question and the choices. So um, the choices, the choice A is citrate inhibits prothrombin by chelating phosphate in regional citrate anticoagulation. Heparin is ineffective in increasing filter life if replacement fluid is given post-filter. Increasing post-filter replacement fluid rate may increase the life of this filter. Post-filter replacement fluid circuits have shorter life compared to uh, the pre-filter circuits. And E-choice is switching replacement fluid from post-filter to pre-filter circuit will increase solute clearance. So... This is a very typical critical care nephrology question regarding CRRP and anticoagulation related to that. 
one of these four, uh, one of these five choices is correct. One and yeah. and and we have to pick one of them. So uh, unfortunately, there is no way of doing an interaction interactive uh, question over here, and I cannot find out which one of you have have uh, have chosen the correct answer. But I'm going to share the answer with you. Uh, so the correct answer for this is post filter replacement fluid circuit have shorter life compared to pre filter. Um, so let's just see look at the answer explanations um so we had a, the first choice was about uh, citrate uh, chelating um, phosphorus so the correct answer is uh, it is it is an incorrect answer because phos uh, this uh, citrate it chelates calcium and not phosphorus um and th uh, that's how it inhibits thrombin generation and prevents coagulation cascade um, citrate infusion rate is titrate to, titrated to maintain ionized calcium uh, in, uh, concentration in the CRRT circuit. So um, as a fellow, when you are do, running CRRT, uh, one of the challenges is a phone call from the nurse saying the filter is getting plotted. So regional citrate anticoagulation is usually uh, the most commonly and the most recommended way to anticoagulate these circuits to enhance the filter life. Um, and and uh, this... this uh, um, citrate it inhibits calcium, which is essential for for coagulation, and that's how it it prevents the clotting cascade. So this A is incorrect. Um, the other choice B uh, is also incorrect because uh, heparin, when it is infused pre-filter, it causes, of course, uh, anticoagulation inside the filter, enhances filter life. And it doesn't matter whether you are replacing the, the replacement fluid, whether you're connecting the replacement fluid pre-filter or post-filter. In either case, heparin is going to work. And I'm going to show you in the end the circuit in which the way heparin is attached. So you will get a better idea of, of why heparin will work regardless of replacement fluid given pre or post-filter. Uh, the other choices, uh, C and E, are also incorrect because pre-filter replacement fluid dilutes the blood, um, which uh, can decrease solute, solute clearance, um, but it helps to prolong filter life. Uh, so both of these statements were incorrect. And in the end, post-filter replacement fluid leads to more efficient solute clearance, um, but it increases uh, hematocrit and leads to shorter filter life higher the post-filter replacement fluid rate, or in other words, higher the in, uh, effluent rates, there will be more uh, hemoconcentration inside the filter, and there will be shorter half-life of the filter uh, due to increased clot formation. Hence, the choice D is, is correct. So um, if you look at this diagram, the red part, the axis, is where the blood is coming in from the patient, and it goes through the blood pump to the filter. Before the filter, we have the replacement fluid attached. Uh, so this is a pre-dilution uh, or pre-filter replacement fluid. So we are already diluting the replacement fluid before it passes through the filter. So the, fil the, the blood is diluted, so there is less hemoconcentration and there's less chances of filter clotting. However, since you are diluting uh, the, the blood, the, the concentration gradient will be less and the solute clearance will be less. So the advantage of pre-filter is that there is less filter clotting, but the disadvantage is the clearance is not as good uh, as in post-filter uh, 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 replacement fluid. Here, this, this, is, this is the other form of uh, this, the circuit. There's the red line, which is the blood coming in from the patient, going through the filter, and then in the return line, you are, you are attaching the replacement fluid. So the blood that is coming in it is becoming more and more concentrated as uh, uh, solute and fluid is removed. By the time it reaches the end of the filter, it's highly uh, 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 viscous and you are replacing fluid later. So there is more solute clearance because of the increased concentration gradient. But at the same time, since the blood is more viscous, there is more clotting of the filter. So that's the explanation of this MCQ. I think we only have time to go through one uh, MCQ. So I'm going to stop here and and uh, give the screen back to Amar, who can who can guide us from here on. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Wakar, for this uh, very nice illustration. The only uh, live webinar we are going to have is monthly one-hour webinar. Other than that, everything 
will be recorded in the platform. I'm going to show you a sample of the lectures that you will get during the fellowship, which is just a very small video, um, just as a promo video. Mr. M, a 33-year-old man, went to an emergency room in Massachusetts, seeking care after two days of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, fever, and coughing up blood. Mr. M spoke only Spanish, and through a medical interpreter, he reported no headache, changes in vision, chest pain, back pain, dysuria, rash, or weight loss. Initially, the blood he coughed up was bright red, but now it was dark, like coffee grounds. He also reported a history of smoking one pack a day for 15 years, though he had recently quit, and substantial alcohol consumption. Mr. M's symptoms are concerning. Coughing up blood, or hemoptysis, can be a life-threatening emergency. On physical exam, he appeared to be in mild respiratory distress. He had a fever and an elevated heart rate. His lung sounds were clear to auscultation. Bowel sounds were normal. There was moderate tenderness to palpation throughout the upper abdomen, but no enlargement of the liver or spleen. There was no evidence of hemorrhage on examination of the nose and oropharynx. The skin appeared normal. A chest radiograph and subsequent computed tomography of the chest were obtained, revealing multifocal patchy opacities in both lungs. Broad-spectrum antibiotic coverage was initiated with administration of intravenous vancomycin and piperacillin tazobactam. This was before COVID-19. Mr. M's rapid heart rate, fever, and respiratory distress are worrisome. The presence of patchy opacities together with these symptoms may indicate an infectious process and administering antibiotics while performing further workup is an appropriate next step. Labs will give us more information. The sodium and the potassium were low, with evidence of mild kidney injury. Liver tests were abnormal, including elevations in aspartate aminotransferase, alanine aminotransferase, and bilirubin. The white blood cell count was within the normal range, but there was a high percentage of neutrophils. Mr. M was also mildly anemic and his platelet count was low. The partial thromboplastin time was mildly elevated. Red blood cells were detected on your analysis, but no white cells or casts were observed. At this point, the patient was given fluids in addition to antibiotics and a proton pump inhibitor and admitted to the hospital for closer monitoring. His respiratory symptoms, together with the elevated percentage of neutrophils in the CT findings, suggest pneumonia or aspiration pneumonitis, a lung injury caused by inhaling food, liquid, saliva, or gastric contents into the lungs. Vasculitis, blood vessel inflammation, must also be considered. The elevated partial thromboplastin time indicates a problem with coagulation. This and the elevated liver function test may reflect liver damage from heavy alcohol consumption. The abnormal liver function may alternatively reflect a systemic response to infection. Electrolyte abnormalities can be seen with vomiting or electrolyte loss in the urine. An upper gastrointestinal bleed is not ruled out, but appears less likely. A bronchoscopy would be an appropriate next step to characterize the bleeding. On bronchoscopy, bloody secretions were seen in the posterior segment of the right upper lobe and the right and left lower lobes of the lungs. Bronchal alveolar lavage, a procedure sometimes performed during bronchoscopy, involves instilling sterile normal saline into a section of the lung, then using suction to collect the fluid sample for further testing. Increasingly hemorrhagic or bloody fluid return with each subsequent sample of instilled saline is consistent with alveolar hemorrhage. Vancomycin and piperacillin tazobactam were continued and doxycycline was initiated. The increasing hemorrhagic return on bronchoalveolar lavage identifies the alveoli, tiny air sacs in the lungs where oxygenation occurs as the source of the bleeding. Diffuse alveolar hemorrhage can present as a complication of many diseases, including infectious causes, autoimmune disorders, and acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. ARDS is the result of an acute inflammatory state associated with various disease processes and is characterized by diffuse damage to alveoli and capillaries in the lungs, causing hypoxemia. Over the next 12 hours, the patient clinically deteriorated. His blood pressure fell and he became increasingly short of breath. New crackles were noted on lung exam. His skin became yellow, indicating a high level of bilirubin. 
he developed renal failure and required dialysis. He became progressively hypoxemic, requiring increasing supplemental oxygen, ultimately requiring endotracheal intubation and transfer to the ICU. Tests for autoimmune disorders that can cause pulmonary and renal disease, including good pasture syndrome and Inca-associated vasculitis, were negative. There was still no diagnosis. What information was the team missing? Timely response to a decline in clinical status is critical. Mr. M showed signs of multi-organ failure, including lung, kidney, and liver injury, despite receiving empirical antibiotic therapy for sepsis and pneumonia, including doxycycline to cover possible tick-borne diseases and atypical bacterial pneumonia. The development of crackles on lung examination suggests fluid building up in the air spaces. The patient's family provided additional history. Mr. M had grown up and lived in a city in central Mexico with no travel farther south or abroad before arriving in Massachusetts four days before admission. He had entered the country by swimming across the Rio Grande and hiking through the wilderness. This information is important. Mr. M's arduous journey likely exposed him to unusual pathogens. For example, hantavirus and leptospirosis, both of which can lead to pulmonary hemorrhage and kidney failure, as well as vector-borne diseases must be considered. Malaria and dengue, which can present similarly, are not endemic to the areas Mr. M passed through and are therefore less likely. A request for serologic test for IgM antibodies to leptospirus species was positive, and a presumptive diagnosis of leptospirosis was made. Serum samples were sent to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, for confirmatory testing. The organisms that cause leptospirosis are spirochetes, corkscrew-shaped bacteria that are commonly seen in tropical and subtropical areas, including parts of the southern United States, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii. Livestock, domestic, and wild animals may all harbor disease, though rodents are the main reservoir, in contact with their urine or contaminated water or soil can spread the disease. Bodies of fresh water as well as floodwaters can harbor the infection, and Mr. M may have been exposed while crossing the Rio Grande, a freshwater river. More cases of leptospira are anticipated with climate change and associated extreme precipitation and flooding. Mr. M was treated with a broad spectrum antibiotic regimen that included doxycycline and a penicillin for a total of two weeks. The treatment of choice for leptospirosis is a seven day course of doxycycline in the case of mild disease. Penicillin is used in severe cases. The empirical regimen that he received was considered to be adequate treatment for leptospirosis. The use of glucocorticoids is not routinely recommended, as high-quality evidence of their effectiveness is lacking. Confirmation of the diagnosis was received from the CDC, and he was discharged six weeks later, having made a full recovery. At a follow-up visit one month later, he appeared healthy, and all his laboratory tests were normal. Leptospirosis can be difficult to diagnose, in part because many of its symptoms are common to other diseases. So obtaining a good travel and social history to help pinpoint a possible environmental vector is critical to making the diagnosis and guiding the treatment. Obtaining an accurate travel and social history from a patient is not always possible, such as in a patient who is too young to verbalize or one who lacks mental competence. Okay, so this is an example of the type of lectures you're going to see. And every single week, you will have a recorded lecture for 40 minutes to one hour. And on top of this, you will have 10 MCQs and clinical case scenarios with also 10 scenarios and journal club with a state of art manuscript that uh, you are going to read, then we are going to discuss. Again, every month, we will have one hour to meet all together for a workshop or live webinar. Now I'm going to let Dr. Roda Khotba from Saudi Arabia to give you an illustration about how the clinical case scenarios you expect to see in our platform and the difference between MCQs and the clinical case scenarios is the clinical case scenarios is usually multiple stations. So it will take you through the diagnosis, the presentation, diagnosis, and the management, and what happened 
uh, to the patient. So this is very similar to what happened in our real life. Can you please go ahead, Dr. Rola, and share your screen? Okay. Is my screen clear now? Yes, please. Yes, okay. Good day, good evening, good morning, everyone from every part of the world. I'm Dr. Ola Uthman, consultant in internal medicine and nephrology. Critical care nephrology and acute kidney injury It is one of my subspecialty. We will talk easily now about one of the cases scenario that we will meet, we meet every day in the ER or in our intensive care units. So how to think, how to take it step by step until we reach differential diagnosis and decrease the field of the diagnosis. Here we can see that we have on the left. Okay, 64 years old man hospitalized with confusion. I can't see. Okay. You see your screen very well. You see my screen, but I can't see my screen. Okay, 64 years old man hospitalized with confusion, coma, past medical history, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, hyperlipidemia, chronic diarrhea, past surgical history, superior mesenteric artery embolus two years ago, and resection of large section of small bowel. Home medication, rosafastatin, metoprolol, warfarin, and inalapril, nothing important. Clinical examination, he was confused to person, place, and time. His lungs were clear. Heart regular, other investigation, other examination was normal and vital signs nearly normal. If we look on, on his lab, BUN was nearly normal, serum creatinine 1.3, sodium, he was a little hyponatremic, potassium 5, chloride 88, glucose was normal, lactate normal, plasma was morality 280, pH show a little acidosis 7.3, PO2 77 millimeter mercury, PCO2 23 millimeter mercury, and bicarb 9 milliequivalent per liter. One minute. How would the metabolic acidosis component be classified in this case? Is it anion gap acidosis, non anion gap acidosis, anion gap and anion, and non anion gap acidosis, anion gap acidosis, and the metabolic alkalosis? None of the above. How do you think? We will take it step by step. Correct answer is anion gap acidosis. How you measure it? The normal anion gap is 12 milliequivalent, and normal serum albumin is 4. But patients with hypoalbuminemia usually hide an anion gap acidosis. So with hypoalbuminemia, you have to adjust the anion gap. And this by making this equation, expected anion gap 12 minus 2 and a half multiplied by the difference between the normal serum albumin and the actual serum albumin. And for this patient, expected anion gap should be 9 and a half milliequivalent per liter. What is, what is the actual anion gap for the patient? We know anion gap is the difference between the anions and the cations of the body. So serum anion gap for the patient, sodium minus bicarb and the chloride. And if we make this equation, is anion gap, actual anion gap is 34, while the expected anion gap nine and a half. So this patient has high anion gap acidosis. Could be mixed with another metabolic disturbance, yes. So we have to continue, need to exclude mixed metabolic acid base disturbance. Delta minus delta calculation could help us in this. And this is by taking the difference between the actual anion gap minus expected anion gap. This result had, be, had to be divided on the baseline by carb minus expected by carb. And if we made this equation, we will see that this patient, delta minus delta, result about 1.6, okay? What we will do in this result, we will take it and we will put it on this table, which, which will help us in inter interpretation. Delta minus delta interpretation, if it is less than 0 0.4, mostly it is non-anion gap acidosis. 0 0.4 to 0 0.9, anion gap mixed with non-anion gap acidosis. If it is between 1 and 2, it is only anion gap acidosis. More than 2, there is a metabolic alkalosis with the anion gap acidosis. And our patient, it was nearly 1.6, so this patient has anion gap acidosis. 
This helps us to decrease the field of the differential diagnosis. So causes of anion gap metabolic acidosis are a lot. There's common causes like lactic acidosis, renal failure, diabetic ketoacidosis, alcohol starvation, salicylate toxicity, a lot of toxicity. And there's less common cause like cyanide poisoning, carbon monoxide, aminoglycosides. If we think that there's possibility of alcohol toxicity and diabetic ketoacidosis, so we have to continue and we have to assess in any metabolic acidosis the osmolar gap. And this is have to be made by this equation, two multiplied by the sodium plus glucose divided on 18 BUN divided on 2.2 plus ethanol level, if it is present, divided on 3.6. Of course, I'm talking about if the glucose unit milligram per deciliter, BUN milligram per deciliter. So for this patient, calculated osmolarity will be, after calculating it, about 274. Osmolar gap, it is the difference between the measured osmolarity minus the calculated osmolarity, so it is about 6. Normal osmolar gap, 10. This patient osmolar gap is 6, so no osmolar gap for this patient, and this helps us to rule out ketoacidosis, organic alcohol poisoning. So after that, which, is, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? It is D-lactic acidosis, ethylene glycol or methanol poisoning, propylene glycol toxicity, pyroglutamic acidosis, or none of the above. I will let you one second to five seconds to think. Okay. Correct answer, mostly, this is D-lactic acidosis. But if we return back to the investigation, the lactate was normal for the patient. Although lactate is normal, but this patient has D-lactic acidosis, the standard enzymatic laboratory assay for lactate will not detect D-lactate because it uses L-lactate dehydrogenase. The body typically produces L-lactic acid, and our endogenous lactate dehydrogenase cannot metabolize the D-lactate variant. While L-lactic acid is an endogenous compound of the human metabolism, D-lactic produced by fermentation of carbohydrate by colonic bacteria. Choice B and C are incorrect, as they should have an elevated osmolar gap. This patient has normal osmolar gap. Pyroglutamic acidosis choice D causes a gap acidosis in the setting of a chronic acetaminophen use. This patient denies this. It's not present in the history. So, this patient has mostly lactic acidosis. Take home message. The standard enzymatic laboratory assay for lactate will not detect D lactate because it uses L lactate dehydrogenase and L lactate oxidase. D lactic acidosis causes mental stasis changes and encephalopathy. And you have to suspect D lactic acidosis if you have short gut syndrome, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, antibiotics that select out lactobacillus and streptococcus probus subtypes, high carbohydrate load. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rola, for this uh, nice presentation. And actually, this highlights the importance of the critical care nephrology uh, training programs. And as Dr. Khaled said, um, this hybrid uh, program is very important because of the crosstalks between nephrologists and critical care medicine and physicians, because there is no single speciality can take care of this uh, critically ill patients. We have to have, you know, um, a multidisciplinary team uh, between the internal medicine and uh, between the critical care and uh, uh, the uh, nephrologists uh, to take care of the sick patient. And now, uh, Dr. Ricardo is going to share his screen and show us uh, a sample of the journal club that you will have every week in our uh, fellowship program. So, Dr. Ricardo is a senior consultant in Portuga of Critical uh, Care Medicine. Hello, thank you very much, Professor. Um, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to participate in this fellowship. I think is a, a very important topic, this overlap between intensive care and nephrology. And I think uh, we're gonna have an uh, excellent of opportunity to spread information, education, and to uh, increase our knowledge in the field. 
So as previous speaker said, we're going to have uh, for each lecture a journal club. So I'm going to open this gate and to show you an example of a journal club. In each journal club, we're going to check to to choose an article to discuss and to analyze in detail. Here, I bring a, a, a revision, review article, but of course, in other general clubs, it could be an FCT article, or it could be, for example, a, um, a meta-analysis article uh, to discuss. Of course, this uh, review article is a new one. Uh, is a, he has less than two years uh, to be published and is a, a very important review, uh, intensive care medicine, and uh, the authors are very well-known uh, parites in the topic of uh, fluid uh, administration, hemodynamics, and uh, the assessment of the volume status. So we're going to have in this review article um, those contents. Uh, of course, uh, we are going to discuss a little bit about concepts of physio physiological concepts of volume status in fluid therapy. Uh, we're going to talk a lot of uh, monitoring techniques. Uh, when is fluid resuscitation indicated? How to predict fluid responsiveness? How to perform a fluid challenge? Which strategy for fluid management? So. These are basically the most important points in this article. Of course, it talks a lot of uh, monitoring techniques. Um, some of these could be used together in, the, in combined with the clinic, which is always very important to uh, know the clinic of our patient, to make a very good physical examination and combine these with these devices we're going to talk to you, um, and it's very important to analyze how is the volumia our patient. Can I give more fluids to my patient? It's going to respond to the fluids. Because as you know, when we give fluids, our objective is to improve cardiac output, is to improve mean mean arterial pressure, and uh, basically to improve uh, the tissue perfusion and the relationship between uh, uh, DO2, VO2. So um, all these will be discussed in the article. And now I'm going to change uh, to show you uh, a question, uh, only one because we have no time for more, but I'm going to show you uh, this question. Is a, a, a a clinical situation that could happen every day in a high ICU. A 76-year-old patient is admitted to the ICU, pauses emergency laparotomy for colon, uh, colon, uh, colonic uh, perforation. Um, Hartman shader has been performed. Intraoperatively, he has received four liters of Ringer lactate solution. He is now maintaining intubated and ventilated with pressure support mode. He is becoming progressively more tachycardic and hypotensive. So this is the question. Which of the options will be the best indicator that a fluid bolus will be of benefit? So please select the most correct option. And the options we have here, the first one is this, central venous pressure, CVP of six millimeters of mercury, stroke volume variation, SVV of 14%, the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, PAOP of 10 millimeters of uh, mercury, um, leg are increment in stroke volume of 12%, left ventricular and diastolic diameter of 4 centimeters in the personal long axis. So here we combine 
uh, uh, and we have different kinds of hemodynamic variables. We have static like CVP and POP, and we have also dynamic variables, variables that change over time and give us a more dynamic and more precise information about the hemodynamic and the volemic status of our patient. These variables are like stroke volume variation, SVV, and like uh, um, uh, um, the, 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 sorry, and like the TLR uh, strategy can be used also in combination to uh, allow us to understand the status of bulimia and the responsiveness of our patient to fluids. So the answer explanation, fluid responsiveness is the, defined as the ability of the heart to increase its stroke volume significantly uh, in, uh, uh, in response to volume expansion and because of the presence of the ventricular preload reserve. So as I told you yet, we can use static markers, but those static markers uh, don't reflect uh, uh, the, the, the degree of uh, uh, responsiveness to fluids. It's better to use dynamic markers. Uh, these markers uh, uh, are related to the heart lung interaction uh, and uh, the perceived leg raising. So uh, we're gonna show you how to use them. We're gonna show you uh, that uh, ultrasound is also a very important device we can use near the bed of our patient. Um, it's a device uh, uh, with a very high utility and combina the combination with these devices like also PICO, which is a form of hemodynamic monitoring uh, less invasive than, uh, for example, the catheter of the artery, pulmonary artery, like Swanga. So uh, uh, during the, the this uh, um, journal club, it's possible to see all those devices, to talk about them, to understand uh, the, their use. Concerning POCUS or uh, point of care ultrasound, we're gonna have in the, the, uh, in the group of teachers, of professors, we're gonna have uh, an expert in the field. So we're gonna have a lot of information uh, of course, uh, there are uh, uh, some uh, approach to POCUS, which is very direct and is much easy and allow us, uh, it's not necessary for everyone to be a, a parrot in, in the field to use this device. So uh, return to our answer explanation. Uh, we can use not only stroke volume variation analysis, but also, for example, PP <laughs> and uh, the arterial pulse uh, pressure uh, variation, which also uh, a dynamic variable. And combining these with some uh, uh, variables we can use using focus. Uh, Passive leg raising is a very important, very utile because it's easy to perform, can perform near the bed of our patient and combine it with, for example, uh, PICO or combine it with uh, ECHO, give us an important information about the level of responsiveness of our patient. This is uh, 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 the example how to do fig leg um, um, raising test and there is some images uh, concerning the analysis using push of uh, the level of bulimia of our patient. Here we have uh, an image about a patient with uh, important degree of hypovolemia, uh, a patient who has changes and uh, 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 respond to administration of fluids, here are some images of normal volemia situation. And in this case, patients with volemia 
and an increased capital load. And finally, we can use and combine all this information, clinical information, physical exam, and these to the, those techniques. Uh, and uh, using these, we can have an algorithm to identify if our patient needs more fluids and we can continue to give fluids or if we can give less fluids, small volumes of fluids. And uh, uh, for example, if uh, we can do it with further portion or finally, if uh, we have to stop the fluid administration. So as a take home message, in critical ill patients, fluid management ranges from restoring fluid depression in the hypovolemic shock to optimization of cardiac payload to improve tissue perfusion and fluid, fluid removal in patients with fluid overload. So this article made a global revision about this topic, which is always a very important topic in uh, intensive care and, of course, even in uh, nephrology. So thank you very much and see you soon in our fellowship. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Ricardo, for uh, this uh, very nice uh, um, journal club presentation and this case and how we can assess uh, the volume in uh, uh, such uh, critically ill patients. Uh, I really appreciate every one contribution today. This was a great uh, uh, introductory meeting. Again, we are going to meet uh, in April and in May uh, before we start the fellowship. If uh, you guys have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Uh, contact me, contact uh, Dr. Khaled Suifi, Dr. Ricardo, Dr. Craig, Dr. Rossman, Dr. Akar, uh, Kashif, uh, uh, Dr. Ashraf. Um, any of the board member uh, will be um, happy to help you. And we are going to give you more and more information in the upcoming webinars about the specifics and the details of program. Uh, next time we are going to show you the point of care ultrasound, how can we use it? We are going also to give you demonstration about the CRRT machine and uh, as, you know a brief workshop in the next uh, induction meeting. Um, so please uh, mark your agenda to attend our incoming meetings. Uh, again, we intended to have a global uh, worldwide uh, um, expertise in this uh, board. And these are 50-50 between nephrologist and critical care physician. So we can see and talk about the whole picture rather than just to focus on one angle of the picture. Uh, to assure you that all of you are going to receive the recorded video of uh, this meeting. Uh, we already have your contact info, so you are going also to receive further announcement and uh, uh, further details about our upcoming meetings and activities. And again, if you have any question, just let us know. Thank you so much. And uh, sorry, we are a little bit over our uh, time today. And um, um, we'll be happy to answer any of uh, your questions, um, you know, in the future. Email me or uh, text me on, on WhatsApp, and uh, we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all.